You may have heard of the saying that a topologist can't tell the difference between a coffee cup and a donut. This is because the donut, or torus, and cup are homeomorphic. Very generally speaking, if you have two geometric objects and can morph one into the other back and forth by means of stretching, bending, or repositioning, the two objects are said to be homeomorphic. Jokingly, topologists have no idea what distance is, but they do see the same structure on the points of the two objects, making it difficult to tell them apart. One property that's preserved under these types of transformations is the number of holes between the objects. Some of you might be thinking, aren't there two holes in the coffee cup and one hole in the torus? Actually, no. If you look at the coffee cup, it does have a hole created by the handle, but the portion that holds the fluid is not a hole because the fluid doesn't fall through as we lift the cup off the floor. Likewise, when we transform the cup, yes, it's true that the torus also has one hole. There are other homeomorphic objects I want to talk about. An n-sphere with some point removed and n-dimensional real space. Here I'm showing cases n equals 1 and 2, but this also holds true for arbitrary dimensions n. Let's look at one of these two-dimensional cases. If we initially poke a hole through the sphere, we can then stretch and bend the sphere into a flat plane in a way such that the number of holes is preserved. And the same holds true from the plane to the punctured sphere, thus indicating a homeomorphism. Also, in terms of sets, it's technically a singleton containing the north pole that we're removing from the sphere. Not just a point. A singleton is a set containing one element, denoted by curly brackets around the element. So, it turns out that if we had never initially poked a hole through the North Pole, we can still map the entire sphere to a plane, but not an ordinary plane. We can only prove the entire sphere S2 is homeomorphic to an extended version of R2 that's unified with a singleton containing some point at infinity which I'll soon elaborate on. I really enjoy these proofs, so I've created a video series explaining them to the best of my ability. This first video will be more of an introduction video. We'll go over the stereographic projection functions that define the homeomorphisms along with some topological concepts. In the second video, we'll dive into some other concepts such as bijectivity and bicontinuity, thus ultimately proving the homeomorphism between the punctured sphere and R2. In the third video, to prove the homeomorphism between the entire sphere and the extended plane, we'll mainly be proving continuity at the North Pole using pre-images. We'll also go over a nice way of proving the inverse function is continuous, even at the point at infinity. Also, in this video series, if you see a line of text that's all blue, this will indicate that there's a link in the description to a separate proof to back up whatever it says. For example, I claim that S2 and the extended plane are homeomorphic. Since the statement is all blue, there's a link in the description for this entire proof. If you are the type to want to better understand these videos, I would encourage you to check out these links. Also know that there are chapters in the timeline if you want to skip to a particular section. Lastly, though I'm teaching this proof for a two-dimensional case, don't forget that everything still holds true for n dimensions. Let's now dive further into the concept of this point at infinity. We'll begin with the functions that define this transformation between our sphere and plane. By drawing a line through the north pole of the sphere and some arbitrary point on the sphere, we can see that this line intersects the plane at some corresponding point. Let's label these three points as n, p, and q. If we suppose our sphere is centered at the origin with unit radius and the plane is positioned at height z equals negative 1, we can find a stereographic projection function, call it f, that maps p to q for this exact setup. f then defines a map from our punctured sphere down to r2. Going backwards, we can also find a function g that sends q to p and G defines a map from R2 back to the punctured sphere. If you would like to learn more on how to derive these functions, I made two separate videos, both explaining how. One uses a line parameterization method, and the other uses a similar triangles method. Links will be provided in the description. You may have noticed that for this function f, the closer p is to the north pole of the sphere, the further out in the plane q gets sent. The reason why these functions naturally define a map between the punctured sphere and R2 is because when we plug the north pole itself into the function f, we end up with division by zero errors. This makes the output of the north pole undefined. But if we want to include the North Pole in the domain of this projection, we redefine f as a piecewise function and say that f of p equals the point at infinity when p equals n. Defining f this way produces a map from s2 to our extended plane. 
Similar to f, we can also make g a piecewise function and say that g of q is n when q is the point at infinity. g then defines a map from the extended plane back to the entire sphere. This point at infinity is a single point outside of Rn that can be approached by traveling outwards in any direction. Another way to think about it is that point Q can travel into the point at infinity through one end of the plane, and then come back from the opposite end without jumping over any empty gaps. So, how do we prove a homeomorphism anyway? Well, the formal definition of a homeomorphism is a function between topological spaces that is bijective, continuous, and which has a continuous inverse. Continuity in both directions can be simplified to the function being bicontinuous. Some people may even say that a homeomorphism is simply a bicontinuous function because continuous functions are always between spaces with topologies and the existence of an inverse function implies bijectivity. This definition is a lot to talk about, but I'll first start off with what it means to be a topological space. A topological space is a set of points x endowed with a topology tau, where tau is a subset of the power set of x, and tau must obey the following three axioms. 1. The empty set in x itself must be elements of tau. 2. The union of arbitrarily many elements of tau must be an element of tau. And 3. The intersection of finitely many elements of tau must be an element of tau. What's important about a topology is that its elements are the open subsets of the space the topology is defined on. This may be a lot to take in at first, so I'll briefly go over the power set and then elaborate on these three axioms. The power set of x is just the set of all subsets of x. For example, if we suppose we're in Rn, this blob without the points at its boundary is in the set, I'll indicate the exclusion of these boundary points with a dashed line and the inclusion with a solid line. If it did contain these points at the edges, the subset would still be in the power set. If the set was somewhere in between, that's still okay. It can have holes or sharp or straight edges if you'd like, it doesn't matter. Even disjoint clusters of these arbitrary subsets unified together are thought of as a single element of the power set. Rn itself is an element. So is the empty set, and so are singletons. These are all elements of this power set because the power set of Rn is all possible subsets of Rn. So now, we can start off by thinking of S2 and R2 as topological spaces, endowed with their own topologies which I'll name tau A and tau B. It's best to start off with why R2 endowed with tau B is a topological space. We'll let tau b equal tau sub r2, which will equal the set of all subsets big U of r2, such that for each element little u of big U, there exists a real positive radius such that an open ball of this radius centered at little u is a subset of big U. This is the standard topology on r2. If this is some open subset big U, it's easy to see that we can form a ball around points of the set that are away from the edges where the ball is completely contained in big U. But what about as we get closer to the edge of this open set? Well, if we first zoom in and then shrink the ball as it gets closer to the edge, we can always find a smaller ball that's completely contained in big U, no matter how close to the edge we are. We can once again zoom in, move the ball, and shrink it as it approaches the edge, zoom in, and then repeat this process perpetually. All right, let's zoom back out. An element little u of big U meeting the criteria of being able to form an open ball centered at little u where the ball is completely contained in big U is why we refer to the elements of an open set as interior points. We say that a subset of a topological space is open if and only if all its points are interior points. And it doesn't have to be an open ball centered at little u. It just needs to be an open subset containing little u where the subset is completely contained in big U. I should also mention that one of these balls with radius r centered at some element x can be thought of as the set of all y elements of r2 such that the distance from x to y is less than the ball's radius. In this video series, the distance metric d we'll use to define our balls of rn is the Euclidean metric. It's just the square root of the sum of the squares of the differences between the corresponding Cartesian coordinates of two points. This is the usual way to define distance between points. Here I'm showing R2 definitions, but the same holds true for Rn endowed with its standard topology, tau sub Rn, which is most commonly thought of as induced by the Euclidean metric. This means that we start off in Rn with the Euclidean metric and with unknown topology. The open balls of a metric space will always form a basis for a topology on a metric space. This is why the open Euclidean balls form a basis for the standard topology on Rn. Some people may say that the balls give rise to a topology or that they induce a topology. This all means the same thing. 
When thinking of a space equipped purely with a topology and without a metric, distance between points no longer exists. If this happens while the topology is induced by a metric, think of the distance function as purely an algebraic expression that relates points. Now that we've defined our topology, another important definition of a basis for a given topology, not an unknown topology, is that it's a collection of open sets such that any element of the topology is equal to a union of elements of the basis. If our basis fancy b is the set of all Euclidean balls of Rn, our element u of tau sub rn must equal a union of open Euclidean balls. This means we fill our subset u with a bunch of balls that are completely contained in u, and then when we unify these balls together, the resulting set is u. So, what if we included a solid line at one of the edges of subset u? Would u still be open? As you can see, if we form a ball around one of these points, no matter the size of the ball, it will always contain an element outside of the set. So that's why we exclude these points from open sets. Technically speaking, these are limit points that we're excluding. A limit point of a set is a point for which all neighborhoods of the point contain at least one other point of the set. So even though they're outside of U, they're limit points of U because any open subset about one of these points will always contain an element of U, regardless of size or shape. Likewise, according to this topology, for the same reasons, the interior points of U are also limit points of U. Another important concept is closed sets. A subset of a topological space is closed if and only if it contains all its limit points. Instead of U, I'll name the subset C for closed. Now that we have an understanding of these open and closed sets, I'll mention that a subset of a topological space is closed if and only if its complement is open. And this is where the complement is every point of the ambient topological space except for the closed set itself. Likewise, a subset of a topological space is open if and only if its complement is closed. So here's an open set U, and here's its complement, which is a closed set. With our topology, Rn is both open and closed if you're wondering about the limit points of Rn. This makes it a clopen set. Now that we have a general background in topology, let's go over why the standard topology on Rn is indeed a topology. We'll do this by briefly verifying that it obeys the three axioms. As a reminder, for the first axiom, the empty set in Rn itself must both be in the topology. The empty set trivially satisfies this axiom for all of its points because there are no points to test. Rn itself is in the topology because by definition of the open Euclidean n balls, for any point of Rn, there exists an open ball of radius r centered at that point where the ball is a subset of Rn. Alright, so I'm not going to prove the second axiom, which requires closure under arbitrary unions, but I hope you can get a sense that if you take any amount of open subsets of Rn and then unify them, this union can still be thought of as a single open set U. This means that we can take a union of open subsets U sub little i across some arbitrary indexing set big I, and this union can be set equal to some new subset big U, which must also be open. Big I being arbitrary means that it can be of any size, and yes, a bunch of disjoint open sets unified together can still be treated as a single open subset. Likewise, for the third axiom, which requires closure under finite intersections, if you take a finite number of open subsets and then intersect them, you'll end up with another open subset big U. We say that some big U is equal to an intersection of open subsets U sub little j across some finite indexing set big J. You might be wondering why there's no closure under infinite intersections. Here's a good reason why. Consider a point in all the open balls centered at that point. I can't draw an infinite amount of balls, but here I drew many balls. All balls on screen intersect at a tiny open set, but we're considering all the open balls centered at this point, meaning we can zoom in and find more balls. Again, we can intersect all of them, zoom in, and find more balls. This continues forever, and the intersection of all the open balls centered at an element is a singleton containing the element, because the element truly is the only point that all the balls share. Also, singletons can't be open sets, at least according to the standard topology. Thus, closure under arbitrary intersections fails. Now that we have a decent understanding why our plane is a topological space, you might be wondering, why is our two-sphere also a topological space? We say that the topology defined on S2 is the standard topology on R3 restricted down to the sphere. This means that it's the set of all open subsets U intersected with S2 such that U is in tau sub R3. For example, suppose that we have some open subset of R3 with arbitrary shape, denoted by this solid blob. I gave this blob a checkered texture to indicate that the boundary limit points are not included. 
similar to how we use dashed lines in R2. We can form an open subset of our sphere by intersecting one of these blobs with the sphere. If we do this with all the open subsets of R3, we get all the open subsets of our sphere. When the blob and sphere don't intersect, we get the empty set, so the empty set is in this topology. When a blob fully engulfs the sphere, this means that S2 itself is in the topology, thus the first axiom is satisfied. And defining our topology on the sphere this way makes it a subspace topology, and any subspace of a topological space is itself a topological space. The same concepts apply for a restriction to our punctured sphere. The difference in the topology is that we lose the open neighborhoods of the North Pole. Defining tau A this way makes it so that its size matches that of tau B. This is how we'll define our punctured sphere as a topological space going into the next video. Okay, so I'm gonna end things here for part one of the series. The next two videos are where we actually start to prove the homeomorphisms. I hope you're enjoying the series so far.